Welcome back to another episode of Stacking Denny's. I'm Jordan McAbee of Rotoballer, my co-host Nick Giffen of the Action Network. Talladega is in the books. Tyler Reddick surviving the chaos at the end, getting to victory lane over Brad Keselowski, Noah Gregson, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. coming home fourth, Alex Bowman with another top five at Talladega. A relatively uneventful race up until the Toyota caution, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And then we saw our boy, you know, we've talked significantly about Michael McDowell not being aggressive on super speedways. Throw some major blocks there on the final lap of the race to try to win this damn thing from the pole. Almost had it, but like I said, sparked that melee. Tyler Reddick in victory lane. Keselowski still winless in his last, I think, 108 starts couple other top 10 surprises. Uh, Anthony Alfredo, our boy. Fast pasta yes, comes home sixth. Todd Gillen gets another top 10 finish at Talladega. He, not, he now has three straight finishes of 12th or better at that track. Daniel Hemrick comes home ninth. Mm-hmm. And Harrison Burton, 10th. Um, That's what we're talking about. That's why you need to use it, those guys in 36 for 36 at these races. You know, your, exact. your Burtons, your Hemricks. Because uh, that's where you're going to get the most value out of them. Yep. Or the, the the higher chance of the most value. And and if you listen last week, you know, Nick and I both had uh, Harrison Burton as our 36 for 36. So it's nice to get, I mean, he finished sixth in stage one too. So we yeah. got, we got a decent amount of points there. 32 points for, for Harrison Burton. I'll take that all season Absolutely. long uh, with, with those lower guys. But, you know, overall a, um, a relatively uneventful race at Talladega um, up until the end, you know, they, a lot of just like we saw at Daytona, a lot of fuel saving, a lot mm-hmm. of strategy playing out. We saw the Toyotas uh, have a very specific strategy, and it looked like it was going to play out for them, and then they just wrecked themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was it was the weirdest thing ever. I still like me, you know, and and how John Hunter Nemechek has screwed a few of my bets this year. I want to blame it on him because he was the third car in line, and they kind of just stacked up. But I think in reality, what kind of happened was Jones got a little bit out got slow and then they just wrecked all into yeah, each yeah. other. But uh, Eric Jones did take a, a massive hit. I tweeted out a video I found on TikTok earlier today. Uh, you know, he hit that wall really hard and immediately, immediately came on the radio and said, I don't know if I'm good or not. Yeah. Which before he was is, even done wrecking. Yeah. He was still wrecking and he said that. And then, um, yeah, it, it, to me, that was quite concerning. Uh, mm-hmm. Like we know that this car, they've said it's very rigid. It, it does not have much give to it. Uh, that's concerning when you, when you hear stuff like that. Jones did get transported to hospital after the race. He uh, went home Sunday night, I believe, or if not Monday yeah. morning. I saw that news. So good on there, but still, he has to be sore. Um, it like obviously we don't know anything for Dover coming up, but you know if he would have to miss a race, it wouldn't be that surprising just because of how hard of a hit he took. But mm-hmm. um, you know, as far as uh, as far as Talladega goes. There were some surprises, uh, specifically at the beginning, BJ McLeod getting up there. You know, we <laughs> talked about, or I know I talked about on my on my live stream how much of a shitbox that car was. You know, he was up second and a half off the pace in qualifying. He was up there challenging for the lead, looking good. I understand that that's a good a feel good story, but I think people need to remember that he was he. There's a good chance that he was doing that, like he ran out of fuel, so he was probably doing that on purpose. Yeah. He was unsponsored. What's the chances that a sponsor comes to that organization now because they saw what McLeod was doing in that race? Not to mention everybody else was fuel saving. So not to burst anybody's bubble, but I don't believe BG McLeod was actually that good and that fast. But overall, no, like, uh, OK, so I just want to touch on that because he wasn't like he was a second and a half slower than everybody else in qualifying or not everybody else, but the pole sitter in qualifying and the only reason he got to the front is because we're doing this whole new thing at Talladega where yep. or, or Daytona where we're just mega saving fuel uh, just to save a few seconds on pit lane. Uh, and it's just – and BJ McLeod didn't have to save fuel, right? Like he was just going balls to the wall, and that, that's how he gets to the front because when the field is running two seconds a lap slower than they could be, and BJ McLeod's only one and a half seconds slower. It means he can run half a second faster than everybody else, essentially. Right. <laughs> if he just holds it wide open. So, 
Um, it shouldn't be a surprise, and it, but it's still cool to see. Like it is, it's neat. It, it is a feel good if BJ McLeod leads laps, and if that leads to a sponsor, that is a feel good story. That might be the only good thing that comes from this style of save, save, save at super speedways. I'm really curious how this and why this sudden just massive fuel saving at, at super speedways has emerged. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Cause like you said, it's to save a couple seconds on pit road, but they're running a second and a half slower on the track per lap. Like yeah. that's, it, this is a massive difference. And, and in reality, I tweeted it out because I know a lot of fans are frustrated about this. Drivers are frustrated about it. Hamlin on his, on his podcast talked about how frustrated he was about this. Um, it's the new style. They have to do it because everybody else is doing it. But like, I feel like something needs to be done to try to curb this because yes. it is. And, and I don't know what they can do. I saw a tweet that was like, you know, introduce a minimum speed. They're not going to do that. If they didn't introduce it for David Starr at Martinsville, they're not going to introduce a minimum speed at, at Talladega. How can you, or, or Daytona, how, you can't really police that. But this, this new thing is just frustrating as hell to watch. Like, the issue it's, right now is stages. If yeah. you remove the stages, this like this style of racing can't continue because uh, all, if it stays green the whole race, you're giving up way too much time just fuel saving for 188 laps. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or near 188 laps, 140 laps or something. Um, but because we have stages, you can do that. But... You know, if some team decided they just wanted to run balls to the wall, like the toy like the eight Toyotas just wanted a single file train while everybody else fuel saved, the balls to the wall would win. But you mm -hmm. can't do that with the stages. So that that hurts. And then like the final stage, yeah, you you save, you save, and that's where the Toyotas they kind of you know, snookered everybody else and they were gonna be miles ahead, you know. I mean not miles, but you get it, like they were gaining two seconds a lap potentially over the field that was saving if they just, you know, stayed in line and uh, gone full throttle to the end there. And those couple seconds didn't matter, but it matters in the, the fact that we have like a 60 lap stage or something. And so you pit with however many, it doesn't matter, but you save and it's less about the time you spend on pit road under the pit you make uh, in the green flag condition, but about the track position, you get saving all that fuel for the second part of it as well, because, um, you know, like, like when you top off at the end of the stage, so if you can stay there as well, you gain that track position. We've seen how important track position is with this car. So mm -hmm. it, it's a little of both. Um, but I would be interested to see like what happens if, uh, some teams just do the whole save, 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 and then other teams decide to push it. Then everybody has to just push it, you know, because you can't afford right. if you're the savers to to lose all that track position. Um, so it's a it's a weird dynamic. I'm not actually totally sure why the math maths, uh, but I, I'm sure there is a a good reason for it. But I think at the end of the day, it may come down to actually like the caution situation, like because of the stage caution, everybody's you know, pitting at the same time then. And the team that has more fuel in their tank has less to fill up under the yellow. And so mm -hmm. they can, um, you know, gain track position that way as well. I, uh, it's, so I, I'm kind of like on the fence about that because I, I don't like it. I don't like seeing these cars not go a hundred percent, but at the same time, I like the strategy aspect of it from, because I liked uh, road course races when they were strategy, you know, doing mm -hmm. the math, math yeah. backwards and having to pit at certain times and, and doing those strategies. I like that. Yep. So it'd be a little, it would be a little um, hypocritical for me to say I don't enjoy this. But it's different kind of strategies, it's, though. It's it, not it the same. Different. It's not. It's not racing the race backwards, right? It's just. Yeah. It's just a, a fuel number game to spend the least amount of time on pit road. And a lot of it is because if you lose the draft, you go a lap down and that, that sucks. Right. So mm -hmm. saving those three seconds on pit road, you know, by having less to, to fill up is, is huge 
under green flag conditions. And then it turns out it's kind of huge under yellow flag conditions as well, because uh, the way this car works. So it's partly the car. It's partly the stages. It's a lot of things. And you know why we've only seen this with this car and stages is because it's the combination of both. We didn't see it with the Gen 6 car with stages because Mm -hmm. that car would get monstrous runs and you could come from the back to the front in a few laps if you you know, played your lines and, and got your pushes right and everything, you would see just absolutely monstrous runs. Uh, but here, you're just stuck. You cannot pass yeah. unless you have help uh, and you can't form a third line. Everything, the cars are so stuck to the track that it's just the reason you can't even form a third line when everybody's going 100% is because it's the long way around, essentially. And you get dirty air from the lower two lanes that are kind of kicking up into that third lane. So, it's just a, a situation where it's this car and the stage cautions that combine to make this an effective strategy. And it, it's bad. It's bad. It, it, it's and I voted bad. I voted bad in the good race poll. I voted bad. I only saw Did 30 you? or so laps. And the 30 or so laps I saw, it was just two lines just doing this the whole 30 laps. That was it. You try it to was... form a third lap and then you just go straight backward, you know? It was, and that's why I saw a tweet. Someone called that a classic race. Mm -mm. It was a finish. You can run that, run that damn race for eight laps and you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have the same thing. Yeah. But if you actually watch that, that was, I was bored out of my mind. Me too. Me too. (laughs) Like I, 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 I I sat at home and, and actually watched the race this weekend and I was not paying attention for most of it. That's how mm-hmm. awful I thought it was. Um, and same with Daytona. I wasn't excited about Daytona just watching it. So um, NASCAR needs to do something. And I think yeah, we've seen them. We've seen them take away the, the or try to take away the stage breaks and, and at road courses. Maybe they'll do that. But mm-hmm. man, this is. I have I have a really interesting point that I think. Um... You know, you mentioned Michael McDowell earlier, and he's never aggressive enough. And then all of a sudden, he is. I really want to talk about this because I think this is super interesting. Uh, McDowell finally, you know, led a good chunk and yep. didn't quite know what to do at the end. And I'm not blaming him. It's you're kind of a sitting duck as the leader in some ways if people aren't going to work with you. But the blocking that he did was a little too input aggressive. And what I mean by this is Michael Waltrip tweeted out. You know, if he'd used 5% less steering input, he still would have pulled off the move and not spun himself out because McDowell spun himself out. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, he he just yanked on the wheel too hard doing these crazy moves. But I think this is a spot where down the road, this benefits Michael McDowell because now he's been in this situation. He has been extra aggressive. And now he knows I can be that aggressive, but maybe just a touch less and that might work out a little bit better. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing where that's part of the reason I don't bet Michael McDowell 40 to one. Yeah. He finally, he doesn't a, he doesn't leave last at super speedways, but B now that he finally did, he didn't know what to do at the end there. Um, yep. And he spun himself out. Like he literally spun himself out. And uh, it, it was because he was too hard on the inputs on the steering inputs. And, and I actually think Michael Waltrip made the perfect tweet about it. You know, 5% less it, you could still, slide down in front of Keselowski, but it wouldn't have unsettled your car so much. So uh, I thought that was an interesting point as well. So now this is a spot where like, if I see Michael McDowell, 40, 50, 60 to one, I'm more inclined to bet it than I ever have been. I still don't think I necessarily will, but I've always been the, if he's 40, 50, 60, I'll let him beat me. Whereas, you know, I think with a Daytona 500 win that he had, Mm -hmm. I think it's fine because he was a hundred to one, right? It, there's a difference mm-hmm. between 40 and a hundred and people don't think, Oh, 40 and a hundred are the same thing. No, they're different. Uh, and I'm okay. Betting McDowell a hundred when he is where he was, but now that he's got experience at the front and he's made mistakes at the front to try to clinch a race. I actually think that is makes me more likely to bet him at 40, 50, mm-hmm. 60. I don't, again, I don't know if I will, but I like, that he now has that um, experience because he's never been in the lead coming to the end of the race. Even when he won, 
Keselowski and Lagana wrecked each other in front of him, and that's how the race ended. And he he was third, so he didn't have the and he wasn't being aggressive. Keselowski shoved the shit out of Lagana or whatever. They all wrecked and um yeah yeah the Dow was, just missed it. It was yeah it, it was honestly just how Reddick won this race. Reddick didn't win this race on anything other than he missed right. that wreck and he right. and he said that after the race he said i closed my eyes and hoped to get through it like that yeah. reddick didn't learn anything reddick didn't suddenly turn into a good super speedway racer and, and if, if he he's, he's not next... a bad one but he's also not a great one is what i'm saying right yeah and and, and he's he's kind of like mcdowell now i think he's going to be overvalued on super speedways moving forward because he won this one mm-hmm. he's really not that great he, he's mediocre. He's mediocre. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. I, like, I would have said, you know, he's about the average super speedway driver. So 30-ish to one is, you know, there's a, several shit boxes or whatever. So I just said like 25 to one uh, sounds about fair on Tyler Reddick, which is part of why I didn't bet him. But anybody, you know, who is about that good can just be in the right spot. And here's the other thing. Um, Keselowski and McDowell had such a lead there that mm-hmm. – had they not been so far out in front, Reddick would have gotten collected up in McDowell's mistake. But because Reddick was so far back, it actually – McDowell went right across his nose, and Reddick was so far back that he missed him. But because that got Keselowski out of sorts there, uh, yep. and then Gregson dived under him, all of a sudden nobody had any help, and Reddick had actually had the momentum – from being the only one that you know kind of didn't get screwed up there, so it just worked out perfectly, Reddick. But if he was like a little more alongside Keselowski slash McDowell, I mean, especially alongside McDowell, but like if he was more alongside Keselowski rather than like a car like off Keselowski, he would have been collecting it too. So and then Keselowski would have won. Yeah, and and if that wreck didn't happen, Reddick doesn't even finish top ten. Like he was he was falling back at that point. Yeah, I mean that outside line didn't have the uh, the momentum. They weren't as hooked up as that bottom lane. Uh, but then, of course, Keselowski makes a move to the outside. McDowell goes to block it. Keselowski cuts back inside. I mean, it's the classic go outside. You have to block, cut inside move that we see all the time. And McDowell just hasn't been prepared for that. Uh, and over yeah. over input, uh, and that's what caused him to spin out. But uh, yeah, had had Redick. You know, he had help from Truex behind his his um, Toyota teammate. Had he been closer, he would have been collecting it. But because he wasn't, that's how he ended up winning the race, which is I thought was pretty funny. Um, so one of those deals where, uh, you know, it, it, it almost is like the McDowell deal where McDowell won the 500 when two guys in mm-hmm. front of him wrecked. That's kind of how Reddick won this race. Yep. Uh, one guy you mentioned was Noah Gregson. He actually, you know, starting 36th, he was the most – I'm not going to say he had the best car because you cannot really judge yeah. that at a super speeder race. He was the most aggressive. Yes. Second in green flag speed, best driver rating, best average running position. Gregson was going for the win. He finished third. Mm-hmm. He was running well all day, uh, obviously. I was with that. so you know, high I, on Gregson too, yeah. 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 Um, I had so him top four. I gave so- it out on uh, the Running Hot podcast. Like, Gregson, man – and without that 35, I know we're, we're I'm jumping the gun here, but without that 35 point penalty, you know, he's right up there with Austin Cindric, Daniel Suarez, Eric Jones in the points. Yeah. Gregson. And like, honestly, it's not going to surprise me to see him win a race this year because I wouldn't of how be surprised at all. There are just certain weeks that he just has so much speed. I mean, we saw yeah. it at Vegas. He had one of the best cars at Vegas. Um, I really like what that team's doing. And, and like, you know, Stuart Haas gets a little bit better. There's no saying what could happen there. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing I want to touch on here w- from Talladega is we saw McDowell almost win this thing. We saw Todd Gilliland who started third, finished eighth. We saw a lot of the, the higher finishing drive or not higher finishing drivers, but the drivers that had that ran up front most of the day, but got collected late at the end mm-hmm. also start up front. Do we need to start? shifting with this new car do we need to start shifting our dfs strategy to lean more toward the guy starting up front or is it still always going to remain you know the back marker place differential place i don't think we do i mean look at the what was it the winning lineup had reddick in it and i think maybe that was it for it was actually it was actually a really 
kind of chalky lineup. It had uh, Reddick, Keselowski, yeah, Gregson, Stenhouse. A bunch of guys um, starting in the back, and Reddick and Keselowski. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it, I just like I I'm never going to. It's a line I absolutely it, could have ended up on. So I lost money. Um, in DFS, I played 150 lines. It's but it's a line I totally could have ended up on because I had, you know, a good chunk of Reddick, a good chunk of Keselowski. Um, I wouldn't say like massive amounts, but I had somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent Keselowski, I think it was, and I had, I'm sure, a chunk of Reddick, and then all the other four guys, I think, were you know kind of in the back. If I remember mm-hmm. correctly, I don't have the lineup in front of me, but it was like Hosevar, I think, or something, and or LaJoy, and then like Stenhouse. I think and, it was both. Yeah. Yeah. And then like Stenhouse and Gregson or something. Mm-hmm. So I, it's a it's a line I absolutely could have ended up on. It's just obviously I didn't end up on it. And it, it's not from bad strategy or anything. Uh, but to your point about does this make me want to load the front more? No, not really. No, I mean we see at like the the non like crazy chaos races. So when I I call the crazy chaos races like Daytona 500 and Daytona playoff cutoff, but any other Daytonas that weren't playoff cutoff or Talladegas, I don't really count them as like crazy chaos. So when I build my model, I use those for like the finishing position prediction, but I still use drafting as a whole uh, as like the inputs to that. But I'm still getting you know and looking at past historical results yeah we get guys more often that start inside the top 10 or 15 or so that end up in the optimal lineup but it's not like we're not sitting here with like three four five guys every single time we come to talladega with these new cars it's maybe two maybe three okay like right. maybe often one or zero it's it's just kind of it's a little more spread out than the massive chaos races but uh you know, it's typical Talladega for me. I'm not going to, depending on how qualifying goes, and this qualifying was actually a little interesting because we had the Larson deal. Um, yep. And we had Chastain, uh, Chastain in the back and Stenhouse in the back. But, like, even then, like, I expect Stenhouse to be in the back. But it was it was kind of what we see where, like, those really, really bad guys don't necessarily end up in the optimal as much. Uh, and then, like, very often in this in this style of racing with I'm talking this non super chaotic races, but like, so the Talladegas and the non chaos Daytonas, uh, we see the back half of the twenties or the mid twenties is like, where a lot of drivers that are like, you're really good. Like we saw it this weekend. We had Blaney Hamlin and Keselowski yep. 20, what first, second and third or 22nd, third and fourth yep. in the starting lineup. And I knew at least one of the, like, I didn't know, no, but like, you figure like that's the spot where like a couple of one or two of them at least will probably come uh, into the optimal lineup. And we did have one. We had Kozlowski. Uh But that's the thing. Like from it's not as likely for the crazy chaos races, but for the Talladega type races, it is a little more likely. What's funny is uh, Kozlowski between those three was the lowest owned. Blaney came in at thirty nine point three six percent. Hamlin was at 31.16% and then Kez at 26.61. So um, it was just interesting there to see how how ownerships ended up this weekend. Like you said, the the Larson deal, um, it, you know, going in, and I talked about it on my live stream. I was like, I didn't see any world where Larson was under 50% owned in the big GPP starting dead last. I don't care what his record is on super speedways. There's no way that a, a guy like Larson wasn't going to be over 50% owned. He ended up 53.19%. Chastain was also back there. He was at 42.65. Um, but still, though, like we saw the typical stuff of people not being smart um, or not understanding edges here. So like Anthony Alfredo, he was one of my favorite plays on the slate. You know, ended up working out. Um, we both had him 14 to 1 top 10. Mm-hmm. Awesome to hit that. But starting 24th, he was 3.76% owned. That's way too low. Which is – which. He's never finished worse than 12th at Talladega. Like, I understand that, like, that's nothing, but it's crazy to me that, you know, like Kyle Busch starting sixth was higher owned than him. And hell, even I think Cindric, Cindric starting second was higher owned than, than Anthony Alfredo was. So that's insane. Still a, still a bunch of just, you know, definite, definite edges to be had uh, in DFS, but it's still, it is still a very challenging and, 
you know, luck driven results. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you can have a great strategy, but you need a lot of luck as well. So, Certainly. um, let's move on to, uh, the, the point standings here. Reddick ends up jumping up to fifth in points. Um, I tweeted out earlier today that, uh, him and Byron are the lead the way right now with top tens. Each have seven, which is a bit surprising to me. I did not realize Reddick was having that great of a year. Um, you know, obviously he got that lucky top 10 at Martinsville, but um, yeah, Reddick sitting there and b- both of them are fourth and fifth in points. So they're not in the top three. No, it's wild. They have the most no, top tens, but they're fourth and fifth in points. <laughs> right. And they both, and they both like Byron has three wins and Reddick has a win. Um, but Truex sitting in second, doesn't have any wins. Um, you know, Chase is sitting there in third. Hamlin drops down to six. Blaney sitting in seventh. Gibbs coming back down to earth a little bit after his hot start down to eighth. Uh, and Chastain and Bowman now rounding out the top 10. Bubba falls to 11th. Uh, we talked last week about, you know, um, this this cutoff line. And, you know, you included Bubba in it as well. You pretty much, we pretty much agreed the top nine are good. So Chastain, Gibbs, Blaney, Hamlin, Reddick, Byron, yep. Elliott, Truex, and Larson are all good. Obviously, the guys up there with wins are good. Christopher Bell is in 13th. He's good. Uh, he's obviously locked in. Suarez is locked in with his win. But where it gets interesting now is, uh, like we talked about last week, this 10th through, you know, down onward with no wins. Bowman, Bubba, Chase Briscoe in mm-hmm. 12th. He's cracking. He's he's knocking on the door of the top 10 in points. Yep. Um, Kozlowski's in there. Logano. Busher, Kyle Bush, obviously. Um but Kyle Busch the, 17th in points, man. That's something I, we don't often say. That is – that just says the state of RCR right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Kyle Busch is obviously super talented, but at the same time, Austin, Austin Dillon is 31st in points, and that's – if if there was a less talented driver in that eight car, I think that's exactly where they would be as well, is yep. the high 20s and the 30s. So – Honestly, it's a testament to Kyle Busch. Will he be able to go out there? And I didn't think he was going to win last year, and he pulled off a couple wins. I really don't know if he's going to be able to win this year. I don't see it right now. I can see it. I mean, he led Las Vegas for a good chunk of that at the start of the race. He did have a great. He did have a great car at Vegas. I always forget that. But that was the only one. Yeah, that's the thing. That was the only one. Yeah. You know, Martinsville. He was awful. Richmond. He wasn't good. He wasn't very good anywhere. I thought he had a good car at Bristol, but the tire issue happened. I mean, his tire came apart like 18 from times I in that it, race. I mean, Talladega is Talladega. From what I saw, he looked pretty decent at Talladega. Um, I know he was pushing Ross into the lead at a couple points there. Uh, I think it was in like stage two or something. I, I don't remember. I didn't watch much Kyle Busch. Like I wasn't paying super close attention because I didn't have him I, anywhere. Uh, I watched like the, the 16 minute like highlight thing or whatever on YouTube of like the yeah. – and and I saw Kyle Busch pushing Chastain to the lead. So, um, I only got to watch the final thirty minutes or for thirty minutes, thirty laps, and then the YouTube highlights of like the NASCAR compilation. But I mean, Kyle Busch looked fine at Talladega. So like he can win at these. Anybody can win at Super Speedways, of course. But um, I think it's going to be like Las Vegas and similar tracks to Las Vegas right now. I could see him being good this weekend at Dover. Uh, that certainly wouldn't wouldn't be out of the question, but I could also see him being terrible this weekend at Dover. There's a wide right. range of outcomes there right now with <laughs> Kyle Busch. Yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, anybody can win at Talladega. Obviously, that's true. Uh, but we did not get a surprise winner. Like, we pretty much – Reddick was in the playoffs beforehand. Now he's just locked in with this win. So this makes the points standings a little bit tighter there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, be, and more important because we didn't get a surprise winner um, at Talladega. So just something to keep in mind there um, as this, you know, the regular season continues, we got 16, we still got 16 races left. So plenty of time for, for other guys to knock or lock themselves in yep. to this. Um, let's see here. Who else can we talk about here? in the standings that are surprising or noteworthy. I think the bubble is so interesting, right? Like Keselowski, Logano, Busher, 
Kyle Bush. I mean, these are like I can't get over Briscoe in there. I like that. Yeah, I think that's great that Briscoe's higher up at you know in twelfth, right there, neck and neck with Bubba for eleventh, ahead of Christopher Bell. Technically, on like number of points, obviously Bell is the win, so he's locked in. Um, but yeah, Briscoe's uh, Stuart Haas Racing as a whole is having a better year, right? Remember, Ryan Priest also has that thirty-five point penalty, and he's ahead. No, Gregson in the points by eight points. Ryan Priest, if he didn't mm-hmm. have that 35 point penalty, would be ahead of Austin Sindrick. He'd be right behind Daniel Suarez in 19th in the points without that penalty. That's much improved from last year for Ryan Priest. Uh, and Noah Gregson's been pretty good. Josh Berry's been the worst Stuart Haas racing driver, and he still has looked good at Bristol. He looked good at, uh, you know, Richmond various places uh texas he looked good until he had you know he crashed and stuff so Stuart Haas racing having a solid year uh but it's i don't think it's any surprise that chase briscoe is leading that quartet i think a is the most talented i i think you could say gregson maybe as well but i think briscoe or gregson's most talented but then added briscoe's experience now uh in this car and at this level and i don't think it's any surprise he's leading the Stuart Haas quartet i do think it's a surprise that he's 12th in points yeah, and and you know we talked about it last week. He, we just went through a really strong stretch of races for Chase Briscoe. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see if he can keep that up through this next because this is where this is where he hit his roadblock last year. Was we went through this stretch of races and this is where he started sucking. Different year though, we could definitely see Briscoe. And I I also um, I think someone mentioned it. They either tweeted at me or it was during the live stream, but they mentioned Briscoe now getting the elite equipment at Stuart Haas now that Harvick's gone. And I never thought about that, but that could be, you know, he he's getting the top stuff. Yeah. I, I, there, is makes certainly sense. A, there is certainly a pecking order on who gets like the best of the best. But at this point, these things are so close that it, a lot yeah. of it is probably just talent, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we came into this, this season knowing the upside of Stuart Haas at potential tracks, but at the same time realizing that that, stable is you know briscoe in any other organization if he went over to joe gibbs racing he'd be the fourth in the pecking order and it wouldn't even be close like briscoe is not by any means an all-world talent so the fact that he's number one easily at Stuart haas is noteworthy i will uh, say i mean if he's 12th in a Stuart haas car what would he be in a gibbs car he'd be like fourth or fifth in the standings right now <laughs> i don't know if he's not really an all-world talent I might disagree there, um, but if I'll, you put him in a, if this. you put him in a Joe Gibbs car, the performance would be even better. Is he doing it on good finishes, or is he just not having bad finishes? Zero top fives this season. He's the only guy in the top but, nineteen. But like I said, if he fives. was in a Gibbs car, he'd be having some top fives, and that's true. He'd be getting those more of those stage points because he'd be running further ahead because he's in better equipment. When you're yeah, that far tw- ahead, when you're that far ahead of your teammates, like that shows me something. It, it, it's about talent at this point. Like well, he's miles ahead of Priest, Gregson, and Barry right now in the standings. And that's what we that's what we just talked about with Kyle Busch. Same exact same exact scenario, right? Yeah, essentially. And and Briscoe does really well a lot of like the driver centric tracks. So I actually that is almost like more of why he's such a good talent. I would be very interested if, you know, if Briscoe is in a Hendrick or a Gibbs or a Penske, like where he would be right now uh, in terms of like odds to win competitiveness, because I, I think he's the top, maybe top 15 or 16 driver in this series. Uh, he just doesn't have like Stuart Haas right now. just isn't quite there. They're coming back. They're getting better, but they're not quite there. I was looking at one thing that changed from last year to this year with Briscoe was like, he couldn't, he so many times last year, they got off the truck and they were just absolute dog shit. Yeah. They were garbage qualified in the back. He has qualified in the top 10 in one, two, three, four, five, six of the 10 races this year. Um, So that's why it surprises Mm -hmm. me a little bit that he only has 27 stage points. 
Sure. Because it's I not like he's that. qualifying awful. Yeah, I agree with that. But, uh, I mean, Chris Buescher only has 18 stage points. Mm-hmm. But he and, also doesn't uh, qualify very well. But you think he's more talented on a better team, right? <laughs> like... I also think I have a like like if, I don't know why because like Briscoe's never like killed a bet for me or anything like to be dead to me. But I just don't like Chase Briscoe and I don't know why. I've never really liked him. I met him weird. at Vegas and I I liked him a lot more after that. He's really cool. He's really cool. He's really nice. Okay. Um, super cool personality. Uh, I've never. I wouldn't say I don't like Chase Briscoe, but I've never like gravitated one way towards him or the other until I met him at Vegas. And he is like, of the drivers I've met, he's the most, I would say he's the most fan friendly, like the most easy going to talk to. Can We'll just like, he was like, oh dude, your Case Kane shirt's so cool. Like, you know, he just strikes up a conversation with you, which I think is mm-hmm. really appealing um, that he's that easy to talk to. Uh, makes me mm. like him like, Way more. Like, I definitely am a Chase Briscoe fan now. Interesting. Yeah, I like I'd, I would never have that um, perspective. So maybe that's what it is. I just – something like that. that he, that's and why I, like, We always talk about these drivers that complain and bitch and whine and moan. He doesn't – we've never mentioned him as being one of those. Oh, no. You know? But he's also not running up front. But we we hear guys in the mid pack and back that complain and whine and bitch and moan. <laughs> Austin Dillon, Austin Cindric, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. like yeah, Austin there's, Cindric. there's 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 just guys that do that, or guys that just are mid pack, at least right now, like Carson Osvar, who just they are just way too aggressive and piss everybody off, and then act like they didn't do anything wrong and stuff. And I mean, Briscoe's been way too aggressive at the end of races before. There's absolutely that flaw with mm-hmm. him, and that's why he's not like among my favorite favorites. But I don't dislike him at all. I, I, I definitely like him a lot more now that I've you know met the guy and seen who he is as a as a person, like in person. He could have reacted mm-hmm. any way he wanted, um, you know, to being at the tweet up that was there in Vegas and was probably the easiest driver I've ever talked to. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, how he struck up a conversation like that. You're not going to see a guy like Ty Gibbs do that. Oh, not at all. <laughs> you know, like that's no. that, that's immediately what I went to. It was like, you're not going to see a guy like Ty Gibbs do that. Um, but uh, you got anything else on this these standings heading into, heading into uh, Dover? I think it's important to point out John Hunter Nemechek, you know, he was in the picture a few weeks ago, and now his finishes are – 21, 25, 36, 34, 33 the last three weekends. He seems like he's he just back can't, down to earth. He can't stay out of trouble. And he's created a lot of his own trouble. Mm-hmm. So just pointing that out. I still that I know, still think that Toyota wreck was partially his fault. I think he didn't he couldn't have slowed down, but he he crunched it all up. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. That was my first reaction when I saw it. But I, I honestly, I think the defining line of the point standings is, you know, if once you get behind Kyle Busch, I mean, look at the gap from Kyle Busch to Austin Sindrick. That's 42 points. It's That's a full race yeah. of, like, without stage points, that's a full race. Um, And Daniel Suarez is in between them, but Daniel Suarez has a win. So that's like... 19th or worse, you have to win. They're not getting it. There's no chance they're getting their own points. There could be, but you have to go on a mega run. You have to go on a mega run. You cannot afford to have as many bad finishes as you've been having. I think a guy like Eric Jones could do it. Um, I don't think Austin Sindrick could. I don't think Hosvar or JHN could. They're just not in enough equipment there. Uh, Ryan Priest is interesting because he would be ahead of Austin Sindrick right now, but he's not, so he's kind of out of the picture there. Mm-hmm. But, like, I think if anybody does, it would be Eric Jones. I don't think anybody else could. But then the question is, is Eric Jones even okay for this weekend? Yeah. And could he go – like, he's the most likely of those guys to go on that run, a run like that, but I still don't see it happening. Well, of course we don't see it happening, but, like, 
I, I think it's plausible that it happens for him. Whereas, you yeah, know, uh, yeah, I, maybe it's I mean. like yeah, maybe yeah. it's like five to one or something. Like, but five to one means we don't see it happening, but it still right. is plausible. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah, that's <laughs> what I said. Yeah, can you believe? Uh, guess Eric Jones's best finish since the Daytona Five Hundred. Fourteenth. Twelfth. Twelfth. He has not finished better than 12th since the Daytona 500. That is surprising to me. Because I feel like every week I'm talking about this could be the week that Eric Jones, Mm -hmm. you know, sneaks in there. Yeah. Mm, Certainly certainly some bad luck, but also certainly they're not quite as good. Legacy Motor Club, not as good as uh, 2311 right now and obviously JGR. I'm I'm going to be very interested to see how he performs at Darlington. I think that's going to be a very good barometer of where whether legacy is is lacking quite a bit or just got off to like maybe a slow start. Yeah. You know, cuz he's so good at Darlington. Um but on to wine about it presented by Louvabella Winery. I feel like there's a lot of potential topics this week to whine about. Got that purple rain. Jordan's got the old purple rain. Which I don't know. I know they're 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 rebranding it to just purple. So we might have to yeah. not say purple rain anymore. <clears throat> well good point. But <laughs> uh, um I have like a list of five different things that I could whine about, including Go for it. the weepers at Talladega. The another. Okay. I got it. I, I got it narrowed down. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the broadcast and I will mention this about the broadcast. You know, last year they said we have so many commercial breaks early so we can show most of the race later which I I took that at face value. Um, and I was like, it makes sense. You know, show us the race later. That's cool. And this first Talladega race, or this, this weekend's Talladega race, there was a ton of commercials early. Yeah. Like, people were tweeting about it, and I was like, it's so they can show the race later. We still got a fucking full screen commercial with five laps to go. Like, at the end of stage if two. If you're going to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Not the end of the race, yeah. at the end of stage two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was there were still like several late co- commercials. I'm like, just anyway. That that's just like that's a pre pre whine about it. My actual whine about it is so another big story lately has been the scoring pylons getting removed from tracks, you know, and it and it's becoming um, where like they're showing up and someone tweets out, Oh, the scoring pylon's gone. That's what happened at Talladega this past weekend. Uh, that's what happened at, uh, Texas. I think Texas. Yeah. Texas. So two weeks in a row, this has happened. And NASCAR, or the tracks came out last week and said, um, we're transitioning. It, it, tracks now have bigger screens where they show, they're able to show the running order, blah, blah, blah. And someone immediately, or people were just like, yeah, they show the top six. You can't see anything else, you know, which is ridiculous. So then NASCAR came out or the tracks, whoever issued these statements this last week and said that the reason that they're getting removed because the company that built them went out of business and they, they can't get the parts that they need to fix them. Come out and fucking say that first. Don't. Don't come out with this, oh, here's our solution to this problem, which is a bullshit solution anyway, because, you know, obviously a lot of people are transitioning to their phones and and using those. And trust me, I am all for adapting technologies, adapting everything. We need to. It's what grows everything. Fact of the matter is right now, you don't get your your cell phone does not work with cell service at racetracks. And a lot of these racetracks do not have reliable Wi-Fi to to for for fans to get the information. Um, so the, that reasoning was bullshit, but come out and just say that, like, why not lead with that and be like, Hey, we can't get the parts. This is why we're taking them down. It's a $5 million investment to redo these. Okay, cool. If you don't want to spend it on that, go buy some fucking turf, by the way. 
and get rid of this grass. Yeah. But there we go. So that's my whine about it. But so These, here's the thing, right? They take down the pylon at Texas Motor Speedway, but they have the money and the ability to build the big hoss or whatever it is at Texas. And but yeah, you can't build why don't you build the the big hoss but vertically and show the running order? Mm-hmm. How about that? That you it, you could instead of spending on big hoss, spend it on a yeah. vertical pylon, electronic like a full electronic LED, whatever like you do with your damn big hoss thing. And that and that's it. That's all you need. That's the easy solution. You can still have a damn pylon. You cannot tell me. You cannot convince me that there is no company or person out there that can make parts for these fucking pylons. I know. I know. There's they, no they, way. That, it, this it's is such a cop BS. out. It is. It's a huge cop out. Huge cop out. And let's think about the biggest race in the world. The biggest race in the world is the Indy 500. Right. The pylon is iconic there. Yep. You can't tell me that there isn't a company out there that can't update, upkeep the Indy 500 pylon, which is the same shit that pylons all around the world on motorsports ovals are. Like, come on. No yeah. chance. No chance. If the and Indy 500 no ch- pylon is not taken down, yours should not be taken down. And there is no chance that if there was nobody out there that could fix it, that someone wouldn't learn it to get that contract to fix it. Yeah. Like that is <laughs> so yeah, just bullshit all around. Uh typical, you know, NASCAR leadership bullshit responses that that overall track, once track, again track leadership, you know. Yeah. 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 That's my <clears throat> maybe. I don't yeah. know. I don't know like because isn't Texas like SMI? And uh, Texas is SMI, yeah. I don't. Well, it's funny because I saw Dover tweet about it, but it's Dover Motor Speedway. So I, think, so I think that's SMI also. But it's funny that they were tweeting about their pylon still working. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the Dover Motor Speedway tweet. But that was pretty funny. Talladega is owned by ISC. No, now it's owned by NASCAR. So that one makes sense then. So, the NASCAR excuse, yeah. Yeah, so it was it was ISC until 2019, and then NASCAR owned it. Yeah. <clears throat> also, I yeah, when I was doing some stuff for Rotoballer today, I was looking up Dover, and I forgot that they added the Motor Speedway to it. That was recent that they did that. Yeah, that's like that's a year or two ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your wine about it, sir? All right. Well, first I'm gonna start off with the. Uh... The blueberry lemonade. I gotta polish this off before I go on to a onto a different one. I'm straight out of the bottle. Straight out of the bottle. Just Absolutely. a swig. Look, I had a weekend. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a wine about it, right? I was in Long Beach all weekend, and it was a fantastic weekend. Um, I think uh, the IndyCar race went. I mean, it was exciting. It, uh, you know, it was a great event. Um, the practice format that they're trying out, I really like. And so that's going to be my whine about it is NASCAR. Just start practicing more. Like, yeah. all I know we talk about this all the time. But, like, IndyCar has Friday practice, Saturday practice, Saturday qualifying. Sunday practice before the race. Sunday race. Like, you can't tell me that IndyCar, which does not bring in the money that NASCAR does, can afford Mm -hmm. to have three practices on a weekend and a qualifying and a race, and you guys can't afford it. A practice. IndyCar's opening practice this weekend was awesome. It was an all-cars session for 45 minutes. And then they split them into two groups for two 10-minute sessions at the end. So you get some clean track. And Mm -hmm. uh, that was really cool. And and then, you know, that was – I thought that was really good. IndyCar is really trying to change how they do practice in a positive way because they know at some of these road courses, street courses, you have 27 cars on the track. It's hard to get a clean lap. Uh, So if you split the field in half, that's great. But – you need the all cars session as well, so you can kind of um, let everybody get used to it, fine tune your cars, and then go into your group 
practices. And I think I thought that worked really well. But you know what NASCAR does? 20 minute, two groups each, you know, yeah. and that's it. It's all you get. Come on. It would be hugely beneficial for checking tire wear, finding problems, getting younger guys experience uh, at some newer tracks that they haven't been to, to just have one 50 minute session. We don't need the three practices we used to have every weekend, but one 50 minute session or, or do like IndyCar one 30 minute session and then two group sessions of 10 or 15 minutes each would be Mm -hmm. badass. And that's Mm -hmm. all we need. And I think that would work great. Throw an extra set of tires and do two sets of tires, one 30, 40 minute session for everybody. And then split the groups in the 10 or 15 minute sessions each. There's your practice for the weekend. That would be great, wouldn't it? I, yeah, I am all for additional practice. And, and that way you get your groups too, where you can interview other drivers and other, you know, you still have your group stuff yeah. that they say they need for TV or whatever. But um, just having a two 20 minute group practice sessions just isn't, it's not enough in NASCAR. And I'm not saying. We need three practice sessions. I'm not saying go indie, full indie car and go one Friday, one Saturday, Sunday morning, warm up, all that. No. But the teams even say, like, we need more practice. The team owners mm-hmm. say, we need more practice. Just do it. Just give us something more to work with for these series because they need it. I mean, especially truck and Xfinity. Like, we're talking like kids are racing. They need the experience. They need to figure out their tire wear. They need to figure out if they have any mechanical issues, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's my one about it. <clears throat> and I the um, I saw a tweet this this past week. I forget who it was from, but they mentioned practice, and they're like, the reason that there's no practice is because the stands were empty when we did have the practice. That's not the point. It's not the point for for the stands to be full. No one's people aren't coming to watch fucking practice except for the diehard fans. Same same reason like yep. the casual fans are not watching practice on TV, I can guarantee you. Guys like us are watching practice on TV. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. It doesn't have to be right. a money grab and a money maker for these tracks. These tracks are doing good on money, trust me. Mm-hmm. We see the profit reports from SMI or the whatever whichever one's publicly held. They're making plenty of money. Just put them on track. Just let them on track more. That's like, it's not that, that argument is, is equally stupid as to, you know, also the yep. group thing specifically going with, you know, the groups <laughs> and shit. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, they need to get some practice and you know what? There are t- some, probably some teams that don't want more practice. You know what? then they don't have to go out there and practice. Exactly. You can skip it. (laughs) It's your prerogative. But when we did have a lot of practice, you know what we rarely saw? We're drivers and teams skipping it. All of them were out there doing it. So I think that tells you everything you need to know. Unless they had a great car. You know, I I remember a few times Kevin Harvick over the years would, if he was fine, if he was good with his car and it felt good, they'd wrap it up early, you know? 10 minutes, 20 minutes early. They don't, they have nothing yeah. else to get. Yep. So right there with you. Um, wine about it presented by Luva Bella winery and the brew kettle. Make sure you check them out. Northeast Ohio companies, some great wines. Like I said, they got some rebranding going on. Brew kettles expanding. I know they're, they have a partnership with the Cleveland guardians as well. So make sure you check out those two companies. Great alcohol there. If you like wine, if you like, um beer order online very yeah you know, make sure you order online get get it shipped to you directly to your door exactly you get a discount if you order order um enough wine and mm-hmm. i'm not sure on the beer but um but yeah that is going to get us into dover the worth 400 i uh dover i remember last year's dover race well um, ended up, it was a Monday race. Martin Truex Jr. Of course, wins Monday races. He won Monday races. This was the race that Kyle Busch had a fucking rocket ship, like stupid fast race car, got caught up with some lappers, wrecked his car. 
Martin Truex Jr. wins. Ross Chastain, another top five. He's been really solid here at uh, Dover in this next-gen car. Ryan Blaney, uh, William Byron, and Denny Hamlin. Byron led the most laps in that race um, after starting eighth, finished first and second in two stages. That was the top five. Uh, Josh Berry was in that 48 car for Hendrick Motorsports, and that's who I want to start talking about this weekend uh, or, or previewing this race is Alex Bowman because Alex Bowman's really fucking good at Dover. Mm -hmm. You look at um, his last six races here, fifth or better in four of them. Oh, no. Yeah, five of them, actually. 21st here in 2020. But every other race, he's finished top five. He has a win here in 2021. Bowman just cracked the top 10 um, in points mm -hmm. after after his fifth place run at Talladega. I feel like that team's getting some momentum. Honestly, I could see Alex Bowman being a sleeper to win this race. There's a lot of and, guys that could, but Bowman is definitely on that list. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of kicking myself for taking him in 36 for 36 at Las Vegas. I wish I would have saved him here for Dover because that would like if I still had Bowman, he would be my number one right now in in as terms of that game. Um, but like I said, um, another guy that's been really strong here in this next gen car, Ross Chastain, back to back top five finishes, led eighty six and ninety eight laps in those two races. Um, but we do have a, a small sample size, one race a year at Dover, so that's all we have to look at. Um, I know a lot of people also pull in Bristol when it comes to analyzing Dover and finding comparable tracks. Uh, what's your opinion there on pulling Dover in or sorry, pulling Bristol in when, when talking about Dover, uh, and just steep tracks in general? Yeah, I look more at just steep tracks in general. It's a track mm -hmm. type thing for me. Uh, and from what my model usually spits out. So if you're Dover helps, or sorry, I should Bristol helps, but like also Homestead, also Darlington. Mm -hmm. These kinds of tracks all have some similarities. And Dover is interesting. Like the line moves around throughout the race uh, as rubber's uh -huh. picked up and put down uh, as a concrete track. And uh, I, so that gives it even some similarities to Richmond in some ways. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting track. It's certainly unique. Track history is definitely important here, but I also definitely look at like steep track history. Um, how are you doing at the steep tracks? And that definitely brings Bowman into play. I mean, we've seen Bowman have great runs at, at Darlington, at Homestead, uh, for example. Uh, and Bowman does really well with tire wear and moving around. And, you know, he's got wins at Auto Club, at Chicagoland back when that was still in existence. Both those are still in existence. They're both high tire wear tracks. He's got a win at Vegas, which starting to get higher tire wear Richmond. So, and, and of course he's won at Dover itself. Uh, so yeah, Alex Bowman definitely in play here. Uh, but you mentioned Kyle Busch last year had a stupid fast car. Why wouldn't he be in play? I know RCR is a little air quote down, but some of it has been bad luck. We saw Kyle Busch just lead a bunch of laps at Vegas a month and a half, two months ago. Uh, so yeah, why not him? You mentioned Ross Chastain, probably the best, over the two races in the next gen car in aggregate aggregate would be Ross Chastain. But you could also say Kyle Busch given that first race was with JGR and um, you know, he won that one. And then uh, Martin Truex jr. Was battling Ross Chastain side by side for, I think it was like third or fourth place in that Dover race in 2022. Uh, or sorry, Chase Elliott won um, Kyle Busch. I think it was second. If I remember correctly, but uh where was Kyle Busch? No, he led the most laps, but he he um, finished seventh. But Elliott won it. Ross Chastain was third. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. that year was second. Um, and then Chastain and, and Truex were battling, and Truex spun on the last lap while battling for third. That's what it was. But then Truex won last year. So, like, there's a bunch of drivers. Truex, Chastain, Kyle Busch, we've mentioned as it, like, repeats in all three of those races. Uh, so I think those – Three. And then, of course, we mentioned Alex Bowman has been awesome here. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. has a 15th and a second here uh, in the next gen mm -hmm. car. Uh, this is going to be a good race. And obviously, you can never count out the Hendrick guys. You can never count out any of the Gibbs guys. Uh, and, you know, Blaney ran third here last year. 
Uh, Joey Logano had two bad races in the next gen car, but prior to that, he's finished uh, eighth or better in in you know the previous five Dover races that he didn't have issues in. So um, it's tough to say. And, and Joey was always really good here in the Xfinity series. He had four straight wins at Dover in the Xfinity series. So while Joey may look bad here, I don't think he's as bad as he actually you know looks in terms of like finishes and stuff or. <laughs> the fact that he hasn't led, led enough laps. So it's going to be a really good race. Um, I think, I hope, I hope it's a really good race uh, because we need a good race. We've, we've definitely had some, some struggle bus races recently, uh, but I'm excited for Dover. It's going to be tough to handicap. I, I, I agree. It's, it's going to be tough to handicap but at the same time. I feel like the, the favorites are set and I don't see, these guys, I don't see outside of maybe like, okay, so right now it's Larson, Truex, Chastain, Hamlin, Byron, looking at the odds. Those are all shorter than 10, which I completely agree with. Yep. Um, you know, all my, all my numbers agree with right now. Yep. <clears throat> we got Blaney sitting at 14, which is a little interesting to me with how good he ran here last year um, and how good he's been, you know, this season as far as, Kind of like, like he was really good at Vegas. Uh, but outside of that, you know, I'm kind of interested in Alex Bowman. I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of value on Alex Bowman this week at 20 to one, but he's also one of those guys that I'm not betting right now because even if he looks good in practice, he's not going to move much from that 18 to one. Right. Whereas, you know, if Larson comes out and he has a fucking rocket ship again, he's going, he's, he's not going to sit at 550. I'll It'll say be that three all of a he, sudden. He yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Larson is, I, I will be honest. I, I thought about betting Larson when he, when they opened him at five, just because of how good that car was here last year. It wasn't and, Kyle you know, Bush you know my <laughs> last year. Yeah. Isn't that what you said? Kyle Bush had a rocket and then finished whatever. No. You Larson said Kyle did. Bush. <laughs> That's why I was did like, I? what? Oh, no. I remember it well. No, Kyle no. Bush had a – I think. Oh, no. Maybe we got to review no, the tape, it... but I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to go back and check I that, honestly no, don't remember Lar Dover from last year. I just don't. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Larson had a stupid fast car, and then uh, – which I, I forget the back marker that it happened with. But, no, Larson was like – ridiculously fast okay yeah because yeah. uh, um, i because like i went back and looked at the data i didn't like go back and watch the race or anything and i was like i don't remember kyle bush being that crazy the, but you said it so i thought about it. like oh okay oh my bad it You're was good. brennan pool brennan pool brennan pool yep brennan pool yep brennan pool chastain chastain wrecked him right up into larson when larson was just yep. flying through the field yep and honestly pool had a great car that day for what it was, you know, I mean, he was running, I think he was ahead of Austin Dillon at the time. I remember that because we were laughing about how bad Austin Dillon was. Now I remember. Yeah. Yep. That's what it was. Yeah. Larson was just flying through the field um, because he, he qualified 18th or started 18th. So that's why that's why I like yeah. Larson so much this week because yeah. I feel like you know if they bring back that same setup they're gonna just yeah I mean it's Larson at a steep track <laughs> yep exactly exactly yeah my bad if I said Kyle Bush I'll have to go I back feel like and you did I could though. I could be a hundred percent wrong but I felt like you said Kyle Bush <laughs> oh no he did Bush did start on the pole though but he only led twenty five laps or yep. something. Insignificant. I think he had issues too. He ended up three laps down, but I, I think he like something happened in part way through because he did lead those twenty five laps and then, um, finished three laps down. I just don't know if it like the car went to junk, but I feel like I remember something happened. I I don't remember that part of it. I'm about to go back and watch. I just remember it was I've a got, Monday race, and I've got all fucking day or all fucking. Yeah, every day this week to just rewatch Dover or whatever I need because uh, my vacation's mm -hmm. done and all the other sports that I typically do for Action Network are done, so I can I can take time to like watch races now uh, and see what happens. Yeah, Bush definitely had a, a 
something definitely happened to Bush because he had the second most fastest laps in that in that race. Yeah. I can go full I fantasy race mode and uh you know <laughs> <laughs> shout outs to Ryan of I fantasy race. He, yeah. He watches everything back. So uh, um but yeah, um so as far as like, you know, the longer shots, I think there's value there at Bowman. Um I'm also interested to see how Chris Busher does this weekend. Uh, he's been very strong in the mm-hmm. two next gen races here. Part of it's due to his qualifying. He qualified fifth last year. He qualified on the pole in 2022. Yep. But he has a pair of top tens here. Uh, top 10 finishes in five of the last six stages here. Um, and obviously we know like Busher's solid at, at Bristol, which is a steeper, shorter track. Um, could this be the week? It's, we, we haven't talked about him in a while. Ty Gibbs finished 13th here last year. Uh, had a driver rating of 88.7, finished 6th in Stage 2. Could we see Ty? Is this the week to maybe bet Ty Gibbs sitting there at 16-1? to 1? I mean, I've been betting him every week. I don't know why I would stop now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. You're going to be like that guy that was betting to Benedetto every single every No, single I'm not going to be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna be that bad but yeah um i don't know ty gibbs should be fine i i, I think he's about fairly priced where he is um but i'm definitely interested in like bowman kyle bush i i've got this feeling man about joey logano he opened 30 to 1 at westgate i didn't bet it and now he's mm-hmm. 20 to 1 at, at westgate which is super book so i don't think i'm betting him at 20 to 1 um, I should have bet him at 30 to one though, because my model had value on him at 30 to one. Uh, and I don't care about terrible track history or whatever. I mean, a lot of it is, do you have a fast car? Joey Logano mm-hmm. week in a week out most weeks, I should say has fast cars. And, uh, you know, if you're a top 10 ish driver and we, we, we all think Joey Logano is a top 10 ish driver, uh, obviously he's 15th in points, but there's been a lot of bad luck to start the season. Then I don't think you should be 30, 30 to one at Dover. Uh, yeah, my model agrees. It it does take in a lot of track history. It does take in similar tracks, uh, like steep tracks, like we said. But just how well you're doing as well is important in my model. And so I wish I'd gotten Joey at thirty. I, I'm I don't think I'm gonna bet him now, but I just got this weird feeling about him. Right, like nobody's gonna talk about Joey Logano this weekend. And he's just gonna find a way to finish third or fourth or something, or potentially win. Who knows? And it's definitely encouraging that um, that Blaney was so good here last year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you know, for all we know, Logano could have been testing something last year, and then if he, you know, they migrate over to what Blaney had last year, then yeah, they're going to be right there on speed. Um, in terms of, I, I think the one of the bigger questions now uh, is. Uh, Going back to Logano for a second. Um, that's funny that you were thinking about him today like, and just have a feeling. Because I kind of had the same thing when I was looking at championship odds. Because he's sitting there at 20 to 1. And I was like, mm. you know what? I actually don't hate that. No, I don't hate that at all. Because if he gets to it, – it's it's he certainly has a path to get to Phoenix. And we all know how Penske does at short flat tracks. Yep. I don't hate – no, Joey I would Logano definitely, bet. I would right definitely bet Joey 20 to one for the championship right now. And you know, and I mean, you know, anybody I mean, that listens to I'm this sold. knows that we do not like championship bets, no. but that is, yeah. I feel like books are overreacting to his bad luck around there. And you yep. know, I don't mind it. I mean, the guy just won a championship uh, in the next gen car a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 20 to one's insane. Yeah, I understand the point situation here, but we're talking about a guy who led the most laps of the Daytona 500, but finished 32nd, uh, mm-hmm. finished 34th at Phoenix, which, you know, isn't finished 28th at Atlanta. Again, another just drafting track, like finished 19th at Talladega, but won a stage. I mean, the guy has had the worst luck at drafting tracks this year and had a bad mm-hmm. result at Phoenix. But other than that, he's finished. 11th, 11th, 9th, 6th, 2nd, and then there was 22nd at Bristol. Which, again, was its own thing where he had a tire problem because everybody did at Bristol. 
But I remember specifically Logano had one of the tire issues at Bristol. So outside of a lot of bad luck, he's finished 11th or better. I, yeah, I, and a lot of people are maybe forgetting that three of the first 10 races are super speedway or, or drafting races. So Mm -hmm. 30% of the schedule so far has been luck races. And then, you know, you throw in a couple more bad luck races and you can find yourself in a position where Joey Logano is, um, and books are negatively overreacting to that, which is a time to, to, uh, Consider. We have no yeah, more I, no more drafting races until the playoffs. Oh, sorry, one the, the Day- yeah. Daytona Daytona we Daytona uh, the second to last regular season. But yeah, yeah. So we have I think that's one two three four six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen straight non luck based races, if you will, which is good. I'm kind of I'm kind of over super speedways right now. Dude, me too. Um, but like Lagana will probably be by the time we get to Daytona, uh, he'll probably be in the top twelve in points, you know? Yeah. And and securely in there. I, I don't think it's gonna be an issue. So then we'll feel we'll feel pretty solid about uh that twenty one championship ticket. Yeah. Yeah. I might have to bet it right now. It could be like last week when we when we live bet uh Gregson over Gibbs. Yeah, head I'm, to head. I'm Trying to find the best spot I can on Logano here, and I'm going to take him twenty to one for the championship. So I'm seeing twenty at Superbook is where I got it at. Uh, yeah, definitely Superbook. I'm just browsing all the others just to make sure there isn't one we're missing. Where? What number would you need to bet Ross Chastain championship right now? Sixteen. How about twenty five? What the hell? I mean, we already bet him earlier. What this is year. going? Yeah, I know, but what is going on? I don't know. I already bet him twenty or twenty two. It was, I think it was twenty two, uh, for the championship. <laughs> this makes no sense to me. Yeah, he's twenty. I didn't. Ross Chastain I didn't even... twenty at Bet MGM. FanDuel doesn't have a odds up at all. Why not? Come Imagine on, that. I know. Imagine that. He's 16. Official, at, official Chastain betting is... partner of NASCAR doesn't have NASCAR betting odds. Bet365 has Chastain and Nagano both at 16. <clears throat> mm-hmm. yeah, Chastain's 14 and 16 for Logano at DraftKings. So... Mostly what I'm seeing out there is Superbook is the best one on, on both of these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to bet those two real quick. I will too. Logano's eighteen at uh Caesars and Chastain's twenty. And then they have to make the championship four. They have Logano plus 350, Chastain plus 375. At that point, I'd rather just go for the championship, given how good they both have been at Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this Chastain line definitely doesn't make any sense. I kind of understand the, the Logano line, but... All right, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in on a uh, Joey Logano 20 to one championship, and I already was on so there, Ross earlier. So there you go. We, you know, you know what Nick and I think about championship futures bet this early in the year, but we both just immediately, yep, thought that that was value. So I agree. I'm looking at uh, some of these head-to-head lines that Superbook has for this uh, upcoming Dover race just to see if any catch my eye immediately. I don't mind Blaney plus 115 over Bell. I don't mind that. 
I feel like this is just like a decent track for Bell. But yeah, I feel like he's, that's kind of like everywhere. He's fine here, but he's not like I don't necessarily think he's like world beater here. Um if we go back and look at Xfinity, he has a win at Dover and a, and a, two wins at Dover, one of them being pretty dominant actually. Uh if we look at the truck series, he has a third and a DNF. So, yeah, it's actually probably a pretty good track for Bell. You know one bet I <clears throat> What do you think about Chase Elliott this weekend? He's going to be fine here. This is a good spot for him. This is a really good track for him. Yeah. Um everybody's good here. <laughs> How can everybody be good here? I know. And it's it's all like consistent good. I mean, you look at, you know, the last I just got the last three races pulled up because I have driver averages up. But we got Elliott, Chastain, Byron, Hamlin, Truex, <clears throat> and Larson. Even with Larson's issues last year, all of those guys have a driver rating of 99.8 or higher over yep. those three races, which, you know, it's just – it's God, it's a Chase lot Elliott of the same guys really up front. Here. Chase Elliott like, is stupid good All here. of Hendrick Motorsports is really good here. Let's be, let's be real. Yep. Um, but and all of JGR is really good here. <laughs> oh man, it's gonna be it's gonna be JGR or, or Hendrick again, and, and and or maybe Ross and which he oh my god he opened at ten to one at Bet Rivers by the way he opened we ten to one at uh, he opened ten to one at Caesars as well and got bet down to eight immediately. But I've I haven't made a single bet yet. Um, this might be a race where because I like so many, I think so many drivers can be so good. I might just yeah. wait until practice qualifying. I might just live bet it. I don't know. I'm I'm going to be curious to see what top 10 lines look like. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, those are my favorite. <laughs> I, Ricky Stenhouse top 10. <laughs> that's, that's honestly a guy, though, I'm curious to see how he comes out this weekend because this is a really good track for him. Mm-hmm. But they have been low on speed all year. They were really good at Texas. Yeah. Ricky was like and he arguably had, he the best car at, at Vegas Texas. Too. I'm telling you, I think Ricky had a top three or five car and, at Texas. Yeah. he's he, His record here, I mean, 15th, 2nd, and those are the two next-gen races. Uh, 20th, he had the 37th. A 10th, a 16th, a 9th, a 15th, a 19th. I think he's you know. like the opposite of Briscoe from 2023. Where remember Briscoe struggled at every intermediate package race in 2023 for like uh-huh. the first half of the year. Stenhouse has been the other way. He yep. struggled at the non-intermediate package races, but at the intermediate package mm-hmm. races, he was good at Las Vegas, finished 17th. Um, wasn't like great, but Texas, he had a top five car. I swear to God, he had a top five car. Finished 23rd because of the getting trapped a lap down and then wrecking with whoever it was, uh, Gibbs. But, uh, now he comes to Dover, another intermediate package race where his average finish is, uh, let's see, eight and a half over the last two uh, in the next gen era. So, yeah. I love Ricky Stenhouse Jr. this weekend. Is he going to be your 36 for 36 pick? I, I honestly don't know. Oh. I was just curious because it was kind on my of, mind from before. Kind of thinking, you know, save him for Bristol too, though. <laughs> yeah, I get that. This is definitely a spot that you can play him, though. Um, he had a really good car at Bristol, and I think he ran into some tire issues. But he was for a while there. It was like, oh, we're going to have a classic Ricky at Bristol. And then it, it didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. Yeah, I am like the Hendrick cars, like we know we know Byron and Larson are gonna be potential race winners this weekend. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about it before that that organization, I swear they have like two different garages where we know Larson and Byron are gonna be fast. And then if if Elliot and or Bowman show speed and practice, the other one's gonna be good too. Yeah. So as as strong as Bowman and Elliot are this weekend, I think that's where that's that's definitely one of the areas where uh, post practice, the lines after practice, are going to be fun to 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 bet and look at. 
yeah. um, with those guys. Because everyone else, you know, like we know JGR is going to be fast here. We know like Truex won here last year. Hamlin can win here. Uh, Bell is Bell. Uh, Gibbs, you know, thir- like I said, 13th last year. And he, he wasn't – he is much better – this year than he was last year. He started 24th in that race too, which is noteworthy considering how important track position is with this car. Yeah. Um, so Bubba Wallace, uh, last two years, last three years, 12th, 16th and 11th, you know, could he finally get his first top 10 this weekend at Dover? Certainly possible with the speed that that car has. Um, any, any mid tier guys that are, you know, kind of like, Maybe sneaky top ten plays. Michael um, McDowell, the last two two years, twenty second and seventeenth here. I was gonna say not him, but Corey LeJoy finished fourteenth last year and eighteenth the yep. year before. So Corey LeJoy, Corey LeJoy's average finish. Yeah, Corey LeJoy's average finish here in the next gen car is sixteenth. But then you think, well, what about Carson Hosevar? Mm hmm. Because this is a host of our type track, right? Steep tracks. He's really good at. Um, I could see Carson Osvar having a day here. Top 10 finish for sure. Like, that's definitely within the range of outcomes for Osvar. I'm with you. I want to look up his, I don't know, his lower series results here. He's never... Uh, I should say he raced at Dover once, but that was in 2020. And he finished 12th. It was his best finish of his season that year. Um, but he only raced seven races that year. Hmm. But the truck series hasn't raced at Dover since 2020. Um, yep. And then he only has made a handful of starts in Xfinity, and ne- never at Dover. But this is very much a uh, a host of our type track, so I could see him, you know, being in contention for a top ten. I, I I definitely think if when top ten lines come out in the near future, he'll be the probably along with Stenhouse the first two I look at. Hmm. Uh, another guy that he was always really good here early in his career, um, Daniel Suarez. Yep, he's another one that I'm going to keep my eyes on. And uh, he was uh, really know, good when... in the lower series, uh, Xfinity, etc. Uh, but you're right. He, when he was with JGR, I think he had like first race or something at Dover it was like a third place finish. Yeah, first first six starts here: sixth, eighth, third, tenth, eleventh, and fourteenth. And yep. if you remember back to those years, Daniel Suarez was not very good. Uh, so those were definitely you know outliers. So here's here's a here's an interesting one for you. Josh Berry finished tenth last year here at Dover. Do you think that was more so his talent or the fact that he was driving the Hendrick forty eight car? The Hendrick forty eight car. Mm-hmm. I think uh And I think I think that's gonna be an area that people are going to latch on to and you know he's gonna suddenly become a sleeper pick this week. Yeah. And those it's Hendrick be cars a are dialed in at reaction. Dover. Yeah, the Hendrick cars are just dialed the fuck in at Dover. Uh, and, I mean, could he finish top 10? Sure. I I just think, uh, you know, a lot of it was a product of being a Hendrick car. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a guy like Noah Gregson interests me. <laughs> the, the, dude, this series right now is so insane. <clears throat> So insane. Yeah, Priest did uh Priest did run this race last year. He finished seventeenth. Mm-hmm. Yep. I will say Josh Berry is good at Dover though. First and second in the lower series. First, second and second in the lower series, uh, at Xfinity. So maybe it's not as much a Hendrick product as I thought. When you're finishing top I still two, think it's Yeah. I still think it's definitely a factor, but it is a factor. I and mean, he, but he is good here. Yeah, he's not going to be like one of my early week before seeing anything. Like, oh, we need to definitely keep. Like, he's a sleeper. I'll wait to see what they practice and look like. 
before I make any. It's going to be so interesting because they can't uh, all be good, right? Like Hosevar, yeah. Joy, Barry, uh, Ricky Stenhouse. Like yeah, all they these, all, all can't newer... be, They all can't finish top ten. I mean, they can, if, but if, then you're knocking out some really damn good guys. If you know, if Hosevar comes in and he's good, that means that these other guys that are sleeper, they have to get pushed down because mm-hmm. that's just how things work. I don't know if isn't AJ Allmendinger really good here too. Yeah, he's technically I don't know if he, been pretty I don't know, good here. I don't know if he's running this week or not. Entry list isn't out yet, but I feel like, yeah. Yep. 18th last year in that college car. I wouldn't say really good, but top 20 good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's going to be an interesting week. It's going to be a really interesting yeah, I just, I don't know. I just, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody to beat the Hendrick or Gibbs cars. Yeah. I agree with that. Outside of maybe Ross. Ross. Definitely Ross. Yeah, AJ Allmendinger is in the 16 this week based off of the, coll- the college schedule. Okay. So that's someone to keep an eye on. Should be him, and then it should be Derek Kraus for Kansas and Darlington. And then SVG for Charlotte. Speaking of SVG, he looked he looked pretty good at Talladega this past week. He was fine. Uh, he he definitely still had some clearly some learning to do, but mm-hmm. if that's your your base point, pretty good. Yeah, I also really liked how the car looked. I li- I like Wendy's paint schemes; they always look pretty solid. Well, I like Wendy's. <sighs> My problem is so the Wendy's closest to me is like. The dirtiest fucking Wendy's you've ever been in. Oh yeah. So, yeah, I, I love, I like Wendy's, but the only th- I, I don't get it because that one's so dirty. Okay, yeah. I got the, I got the, uh, starting or the entry list up now. Johnson's racing this week. Yeah, that's right. Jimmy Johnson's back in Dover. <laughs> shit, he, he, he's pretty good here. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> How many wins does he have here? Like eight 11? or something? I don't remember. 11, 11 wins and 36 starts. God, that's insane, dude. And you I know forgot, what's crazy? Out of I those. Jimmy's back. Over half of those 11 wins, he started outside of the top five, too. Wow. He had he had one race with a perfect driver rating in 2009 and then he had one two he had one two three four five six six races here with a driver rating of 145 or higher <laughs> out of 150. <laughs> That's bonkers. God, that's nuts. Yeah. Man. All right. Let's get to our picks to win. Um, We did not have a good week last week. <laughs> I was going to say, I had Christopher Bell on a uh, randomizer. Yeah. Um, and I and I went with that Jones boy. So that Toyota wreck did, was not very good for us. <laughs> Well, Bell had wrecked before the Toyota wreck. He did, didn't he? No, yeah. he he wrecked the Toyota wreck. No, he didn't wrecked he? before that with uh, it was like Justin Haley or something. It was like the first wreck that was for cause in the whole race, and then the Toyota wreck happened. Yep, you're right. See, I watched my highlights. I watched my highlights of the race. There we go. You have so so you you now have two straight finishes outside the top thirty. So you got to get back on track here. I do, I do. And you are up first this week. Oh, with pick to win. I'm going Kyle Larson. You bastard. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can't go wrong there. That's a great pick. 
And like I said, if he has that same car from last year. Yeah, that's not a 36 for 36 pick, but that is a pick to win pick for sure. Honestly, I'm like I told you last week, I'm thinking about taking him at 36 for 36. That's fair. That is um I don't know. I just have a gut feeling. My pick to win though is I, I think I'm gonna stay in the Hendrick camp. Kind of want to go true X, but I am going to go with Chase Elliott. Interesting. I want to go Byron, but I, I just, I have that gut feeling about Chase Elliott. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know why. Man, this race, I, I, I've, now I'm kind of like dreading betting this race. I just want to bet some long shot top tens and that's it. <laughs> I'm like with you betting there. I to love win this race. Betting to win this race is going to be so hard because a bunch of people can. I'm with you though. I think, I think live betting this is going to be fun. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm just not a big outright winner better unless I see a ton of value. I just I've never have been for whatever reason a very good at that. So Yeah. Yeah, I'm going I'm going Chase Elliott. I think he's gonna I think he's gonna come and have a have a really good car this weekend. And you got Larson, which can't go wrong there. So on to thirty six for thirty six. Dude, I don't even know. There's so many people I could use this week. Yep. Like, just starting right on the top of the pylon, number one, Ross Chastain. Like, very usable this week. Yep. The question is, do you save him for Phoenix if he somehow makes it to the championship race, right? Well, even if he doesn't. I mean, we saw last year, he doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Number four, Josh Berry. Number five, Kyle Larson. Right? Like, you could use yep. those guys. Number six, Keselowski, you could use him here. Uh, for me, I, I I know you've already used him. Um, number eight, Kyle Busch. This is a spot I would consider using Kyle Busch. Number nine, Chase Elliott. Spot where I'd consider using him. Uh, number ten, I'll probably save Gregson for something else. But I, I certainly don't hate using him here. But I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't think I would. Eleven, Hamlin, I think we can use elsewhere. 12, Blaney, I think we use elsewhere. Um, 15, I'm not using a fucking wear car here. Uh, 16, I'm not, as much as like Almendinger, I'm not using them here. Uh, 17, I could see myself using Chris Bush here, right? Like, it, it's 19, like, this is a good track for Truex. <laughs> yep, yep. God, Bell, I mean, it's a good track for him, but I think you probably just save him for, like, New Hampshire or something. Um... Dude, what a what a track! What a set of options I have here. Not using the thirty four, thirty eight, forty three. No, uh, Stenhouse. You could consider him for sure. Uh huh. Not using the fifty one. Probably not using Ty Gibbs. Seventy one Zane Smith. I don't think I'm using him. Although he is, I think Zane Smith is pretty good here too. Let me pull up Zane Smith's record here. I think it's pretty strong. Um, Zane Smith, dominant win at Dover in 2020 in the Truck Series. And that's his only Truck Series start at Dover. And then finished ninth at Dover and ninth at Dover in 2019. So even before he was ever a Truck Series driver for Junior Motorsports. So it's like tough to say how good Zane Smith is here or not, but his only like real race here has been a dominant win. Uh, and then Daniel Suarez is you, you definitely consider using Suarez here for you know one of Suarez's better tracks. It's a tough week, man. Like Josh Berry is calling my name. 
but I could see using him at Martinsville, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to save Josh Berry. I think I'm going to save Ross, but I might use Ross. I think I'm going to use Chris Buescher here. I really? Think that, I'm gonna that kind of surprises me. Chris, yeah, like you could use him at road courses too, though. But he just seems to be like a back half of the top ten road course guy most times. Uh huh. Boy, where else would I use Busher? <laughs> Bristol. Yeah, but I would use Stenhouse at Bristol, right? So. Yeah. I mean, if I use Stenhouse here, then I use Busher at Bristol, and I don't know what the better order is here. Right. Um, almost got to go Chris Busher though. Like, I could see myself going rowdy. Bro, I don't know what to do. Oh, my God. Like, if I, let me think about rowdy. Like, where else am I going to use him? I'm heavily considering rowdy right now. Busher or rowdy? Cause like I don't want to use guys that I think could be in the championship race, and I don't think either of those two will be. I could see either of them getting in if the right circumstances play out, but <sighs> that's the only reason like I'm not even going Ross right now because I really want to go Ross. Ah, oh, dude, this sucks. This is a tough one, and I we we both already used Bowman, so he's out. Yep. Like yeah. I said, if I still had Bowman, that'd be my that'd be my end right there. Ah, uh, Rowdy or Busher? Ah, uh, this it. I think it comes down to those two for me. I might have to just coin flip these two. Um. Might just have to coin flip these two. All right, I'm doing a coin flip, I think, between Rowdy and Busher. Uh, I'm going to go Chris Busher. Chris Busher. That's a solid pick. I like it's that. Tough. It's tough, man. It's tough, but I'm going to go Chris Buescher. I like that. I, uh, I kind of want to go Ross. I really, really – like coming into this, I thought I was going to go Ross into the episode. And then we talked about so much other stuff. Yeah. The – here's why I'm not going Ross. I'm going to go Ross at Nashville. See, I think I'm possibly going like Suarez at Nashville or something. Ross has just been so good at Nashville. Oh, of course. Um, but a few guys have been really good at Nashville. But Ricky Stenhouse has been good at Nashville. <laughs> right. And that's who I'm leaning on going is, uh, is Stenhouse this week, although Suarez could come into play here. Uh, what do I want to do? Um, give me, I, I'm going to go, <sighs> man, this is tough. It is really this is tough. tough. This is one of the tougher weeks we've had. Kind of want to go Barry. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Barry. I'm thinking Chastain. I'm thinking Stenhouse. I'm kind of thinking LaJoy. <clears throat> but I could save LaJoy oh, for yeah. a super speedway and yeah. not be mad about it. I've already used LaJoy. That's why I didn't mention him. But uh, yeah. yeah. 
Chase Elliott, man. Like, <laughs> you picked him to right. win. <laughs> I'm going Ross. Woo. I mean, I like it. I do like it. I do like it. Obviously, I was. I said he was my number one coming in. Yep. I might regret it later, but I'm going Ross. There it is. Ross the boss. I like it. I just feel like the difference between Ross and Busher here isn't super monstrous. So mm -hmm. I'm getting a little value by going Busher. Given we generally think Ross is better over the course of a, a season. Right. Can you believe it's been since Vegas that since Chastain has had a top five finish and that's his only top five this year? That's insane. I can't believe that. He hasn't had a top ten since Coda. Yeah. Wouldn't I, wouldn't have guessed that at all. Hmm. Dude, Dover's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be a good race. It is. I'm excited for it. There's so many guys that could be so good here. Honestly, I wish Brennan Poole was in the race. <laughs> I really do. I wish Brennan Poole was racing in that 15 car. Yeah, Kaz Grawl is back in it Yeah, this week. I, I feel like we should give Brennan Poole another shot just for how he got screwed last year by uh, Ross Chastain. They, I don't know. Chastain did say he lifted early in, in the, the fire out the pipes show it as well but, yeah but chastain still can't run into the back of him that's true so, yeah like that was a hundred percent on chastain and, you know brendan pool came out and was like somebody needs to beat his ass <laughs> i love yeah. that that was an awesome interview yeah. all right there it is time to wrap up this special monday edition of Stacking we have dinners. more to talk about than we thought we would coming in. I know. I know. For for there not being many betting lines out there or, and and just Talladega in general, we did have a lot to talk about. But Dover this weekend, next week after that is uh, Kansas. Mm -hmm. We got a great stretch of races coming up. Oh, yes, we do. Dover, Kansas, Darlington. Then the man. 600. Gateway has been pretty good both years that we've been in the next gen. Sonoma is going to be the worst one. Like these next five races are going to be awesome. And Sonoma is going, Sonoma. going to blow ass. Yeah, I forgot about the all-star race, but just talking about points paying. Um, Sonoma's, I think, I think Sonoma is going to suck terribly, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be open-minded about it, but I think it's going to suck Yeah, then terribly. we got Iowa and... New Hampshire, Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited these next three weeks. Dover, Kansas, Darlington. This is this is going to be good. And then you always have to be excited for the uh, the 600. It's just it's motorsports yep. day. Yep. Yeah, we're we're Absolutely. we're entering the heart of motorsports season. Um, it's a good good time of year. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Good luck to everybody this weekend at Dover. The worth 400 betting fantasy wise. Hopefully you learned something in this episode and we'll be back next week to talk about Kansas. Yeah. I, hey, See you guys. I, I learned in this episode, so hopefully you all did. <laughs> yeah. And we'll go back and check if I said Kyle Bush or Kyle Larson. That's right. That's <laughs> I, I feel like it did. Not, now I might look like the dumb one, but either way, yeah. you know, Kyle Bush still also had a good car last year. Until yep. shit hit the fan. Yep. All right. See you guys.